Hello friends, Rebecca Vernon here, Blood of Yehoshua Ministries, and today's pop culture poison topic is, in honor of the holiday, is on Fat Tuesday, the conclusion of Mardi Gras, aka what it is known for in reality as Shrovetide. So, get your Bibles and let's get started. Okay, I actually had no idea what I was going to talk about today. Um, there were some topics I have been thinking about talking about, and I knew that they were not what I wanted to discuss today. Um, then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, uh, it's Fat Tuesday, and you're going to talk about it. So I started researching some things to include and um, had no idea the level of which this was going to go. This is a very deep rabbit hole, my friends. So, um, yeah, uh, put on, like, grab an oxygen tank because we're going way down into the depths, subterranean levels here. Um, okay, let's see. First of all, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, translates to Fat Tuesday, and it became a legal holiday in Louisiana in 1875, but today it's celebrated across the country and even worldwide, um, and its roots are from ancient Rome, and it's a pagan ritual, okay, um, and it, uh, it's paying homage to Jerilo, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, nor do I care, the god of uh, vegetation, fertility, and springtime. And since ancient times, this holiday was timed to the day of uh, the vernal equinox, March 20th to the 21st, and the new year began on this day. In Egypt, people celebrated the fertility goddess Isis, in Greece, the people honored the goddess Cora, Demeter, and Athena. The celebrations in honor of the goddess Minerva in Rome were held for five days after the equinox. And in pagan Russia, remember that, Russia, okay? In pagan Russia, the Shrovetide week began on the vernal equinox, okay? And was the heir of an older festival associated with the cult of the spring bear. It's going to go deeper. Originally known as Shrovetide, Fat Tuesday involves sun worship, offering of cakes for the Queen of Heaven, which is expressly forbidden in the Bible, necromancy in the form of recognizing familiar spirits and ancestral worship, along with the consumption of food that is sacrificed to idols, also forbidden in the Bible. All of this combined with divination, gluttony, drunkenness, lewd behavior, lasciviousness, often celebrated as a parade, a masquerade, make up the Fat Tuesday Mardi Gras holiday we are all familiar with. Acts 5, or I'm sorry, 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye same from meat offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, which if ye you keep yourselves, ye you do well, fare you well. Sorry, I'm getting a little tense here. Okay, considering the definition of holiday, did you hear that? My voice got a little deeper because I'm getting authoritative here. Considering the definition of holiday, originally meaning holy day, further defined as a day in which religious observance is held. This devout spectacle of indulgence hardly seems appropriate. What religion are you observing? Seriously. Okay. Um, 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We know the Bible says, Be ye in the world, but not of the world, right? Um, abstain from fresh, fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. 1 Peter 2.11 
And right here, uh, and in your Bibles, Romans 1, 26, 32. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another. Men with women, or men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Romans 1, 26-32 Perhaps the worst aspect of Mardi Gras is the flagrant honoring of false gods. Not only do over half the crews, which we'll talk about in a minute, display the names of pagan Greek and Roman gods, many of the rites belonging to ancient heathen societies are acted out as if they are legitimate forms of worship. The names, themes, and images of their gods are everywhere. However, the Almighty unequivocally states, And all things that I have said unto you be circumspect, and make no mention of the names of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Exodus 23, 13. Christians need to realize that these modern perversions of ancient pagans are just as great a sin today as they were in the past. This drunken revelry is simply giving to perverse, giving into uh, perverse human nature. It does not reflect uh, the moderation taught in scripture. Paul said, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, gluttony, idolatry, lawlessness, and even witchcraft. Huh, Mardi Gras. Described as he, right? Uh, fights break out. Ra um, sorry, I lost my place. That's giving us idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm-mm. -uh. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Look it up. Mardi Gras is just filled to the brim with adultery, fornication, drunkenness, gluttony, idolatry, lawlessness, and even witchcraft. Fights break out, rapes, murders take place. Uh, thieves are constantly on the prowl. New Orleans law enforcement tells you don't take a purse, don't take lots of money. You're going to get robbed, probably. I mean, they warn you not to do it. Um, it's called a pickpocket's dream. The entire celebration is about reveling in some form of sin. It is no place for any true Christian. And you don't even have to go there to celebrate. I mean, any bar in town is going to be celebrating it no matter where you live in the United States. Mm -mm. Nope. Shrove Tuesday is exactly 47 days before Easter Sunday. Whenever that falls, right? Um, Sunday, <clears throat> a movable feast based on the cycles of the moon. The date can fall anywhere on or between the 3rd of February or the 9th of March. This year is celebrated today, the 17th of February, 2015. Um, while last year it was observed on March 4th. The next time Shrove Tide will land on the 17th of February, uh, on February 17th, will be 2026. So, if this is not further aid in proving that 
Easter Sunday has like nothing to do with the anniversary of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, excuse me, Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and everything to do with the preservation of the pagan practices of the occult of Rome. currently known as the Roman Catholic Church, then you just simply don't want to know the truth. Like many other European holidays, the um, uh, Shrovetide, also known as Pancake Day, uh, was originally a pagan holiday before the Christian era. The Slavs believed that the change of seasons was a struggle between Jerilo the god of vegetation, fertility, and springtime, and the evil spirits of cold and darkness. People believe that they had to help Jerillo. Not a very powerful god, right? If he needs the help of humans. The people believe they had to help Jerillo to fight against winter and bring in spring. The most important part of Shrovetide Week the whole celebration of the arrival of spring that lasted one week was making and eating pancakes. The hot round pancakes symbolized the sun. The Slavs believed that by eating pancakes, they got the power, the light, and the warmth of the sun. The first pancake was usually put on the window <laughs> for the spirit of the ancestors. And on the last day of the Shrovetide week, some pancakes and other food were burnt in a bonfire as a sacrifice to the pagan gods. Right. Here's some more traditions about this wonderful holiday that's supposed to be Christian. Mm -hmm. Pancakes are associated with the day uh, Proceeding Lent because they were a way to use up rich food such as eggs, milk, and sugar before the fasting season of the 40 days of Lent. The liturgical fasting emphasized eating plainer food and refraining from food that would give pleasure. In many cultures, this means no meat, dairy products, or eggs. Well, let's look at Jeremiah, okay? Uh, 717. <clears throat> Since we brought up uh, the pancakes and leaving it out, uh, on the windowsill and the sun worship. Mm -hmm. Seest not uh, blah, 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 blah. Jeremiah seven seventeen. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough and make cakes to the queen of heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto other gods, and they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? Saith the Lord. Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beasts and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. Do we think we're better than Judah, beloved of God, chosen of ancient of days? Are we better than them? Do we pro dare provoke God to that wrath? Seriously? Anyway, <coughs> excuse me, in Newfoundland and Cape Britain Island, small tokens are frequently cooked in the pancakes. And children, do not make the children stumble. Children delight in discovering the objects which are intended to be divinatory which are put into the pancakes. For example, the person who receives a coin will be wealthy. A nail indicates they'll become, uh, will, uh, marry a carpenter. Sorry, whoever wrote this from the history had terrible grammar skills. Um, so Deuteronomy 18.10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that use divination or any observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, Jehovah. And because of these abom 
uh, of these abominations, the Lord thy God drive them out before thee. The children of the hamlet of Whitechapel, Lancashire, keep alive a local tradition by visiting local households and asking, please, a pancake, to be rewarded with oranges or sweets. Sounds kind of like Halloween. Hmm. It is thought that the tradition arose when farm workers visited the wealthier farm and manor owners to ask for pancakes or pancake fillings. In the Bohemian region of the Czech Republic, and here we just go straight witchcraft, okay? A mummer known as the Oats Goat. The Oats Goat. Traditionally is led from house to house. On Shrove Tuesday, he dances with the women of the house, and in return, they feed him and give him money. Like the Foschnox Bar or Shrovetide Bear in parts of Germany, the oats goat is dressed in straw and wears horns on his head. He is associated with fertility. At one time, it was widely believed that dancing with the Foschnacht bar ensured the growth of crops. Hmm. So, um, Shrotide, Fat Tuesday, um, is described as a religious Christian holiday. Uh, observed between February 3rd, and, uh, February 3rd and March 9th, the day before Ash Wednesday. And it's it says where it's celebrated is England, Europe, Scandinavia, United States, and by Christians all over the world, and pagans too, apparently. Um, symbols and customs, games, pancakes, and the Shrovetide Bear, and the goat, apparently. Uh, related holidays, Ash Wednesday, Carnival, and Lent. Okay, as we will find out in a little while, there are other holidays associated with this. No, Now, more about the origins. I had no idea how deep this rabbit hole goes. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible. Shrove Tuesday is a Christian holiday related to Ash Wednesday and Lent. The last three days before Ash Wednesday were refer referred to as Shrove Tide. Traditionally, a period of uh, penitence. 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 Excuse me. The final day, Shrove Tuesday, was the last opportunity for Christians to confess their sins before the start of Lent. Or um, revel in them, apparently. Also known as Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras in French, or Pancake Tuesday. Shrove Tuesday was also a time for merrymaking. Back in the days when Lent required wearing dark clothing, eating meals without meat, and banning all forms of pleasure and entertainment for 40 days. It was customary for people to have a good time on the day before these restrictions went into effect. Because they had to use up all the fat, eggs, and butter in the house, housewives used these ingredients to make donuts, pancakes, and other rich foods in England. Shrove Monday was sometimes referred to as Collop Monday, for the same reason a collop being a slice of meat. In addition, eating more than usual, people would play games and hold costume parades. Not sure what that has to do with food, but okay. Um, the Mardi Gras celebration in New Orleans is typical of the masquerades and dancing in the streets that still take place in many countries on this day. Okay. Symbols and customs. The games. It was customary to hold seasonal games and contests on Shrove Tuesday in England and elsewhere in Europe. Such activities may originally have been designed to promote fertility. Again, with the fertility. The Bible goes on. Seriously, God opens the womb. He opens Sarah's womb in her 90s. Hannah's womb. I mean, I don't remember any of these old ladies <laughs> that God is, or um, 
Rachel wasn't old, but she couldn't have children. Uh, God opened the womb. It wasn't dancing with a goat or eating certain food or what game did, are they about to play? Uh, we'll find out. But it wasn't none of this nonsense. It was God. <sighs> so apparently the games became more brutal after 1533. Uh... Blah, blah, blah. Shrovetide games were widespread pre Lenten celebration and died out in most areas because they became too dangerous and caused too much damage, but survived in a few small towns. More on pancakes. More cakes to the Queen of Heaven or the Feast of Ovens, which took place on February 17th. Oh, that's today. A movable feast that lasted a week involved making an offering of far, a flour made from the oldest kind of Italian wheat, which was then roasted in the oven and crushed in a primitive mill and served in the form of cakes. Centuries later, Shrove Tuesday became associated with frying pancakes, which gave housewives an opportunity to use up their leftover crap. Okay. Because so many pancakes were made on this day, they also feature prominently in the games. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, Shrove Tide Bear. A Western uh, in Western Europe, specifically rural areas, it was traditional at one time to dramatize death of carnival. On Shrove Tuesday, by condemning to death a scarecrow or straw man dressed in an old pair of trousers and known as the Shrove Tide Bear of Foschnachsbar, the effigy would often be beheaded, laid in a coffin, and burned in the churchyard on Ash Wednesday. Sometimes it would be hanged, burned, drowned, or thrown in the village dump. Really? In some areas it was believed that if the last woman to marry jumped over the fire, In which the short type was burned, it would be it would make her fertile. What? In Bohemia, in the Eastern Czech Republic, a person in a mask of disguise known as the Oats Goat, which we already went over. Yeah, no. And where does this burning straw people even come from? Hmm. Let's see. Caesar and the geographer Strabo. <coughs> Excuse me. Mentioned the wicker man as one of many ways the druids of Gaul performed sacrifices. Caesar reports that some of the Gauls built effigies out of sticks and placed living men inside, then set them on fire to pay tributes to the gods. Caesar writes that though the druids generally used those found guilty of crimes deserving death as they pleased the gods more, they sometimes used slaves and innocent men when no delinquents could be found. One medieval commentary, the 10th century Comenta Bernincia, states that men were burned in a wooden mannequin to sacrifice to Tyrannus. Okay. So, let's go to the modern era. Things you might not know about Mardi Gras. So, um... <clears throat> Excuse me again. I'm trying not to get sick. Uh, we had a 43 degree drop in temperature here in 20, less than 24 hours. So, um, excuse me. Let's talk about the masks. Masks are an integral part of Mardi Gras uh, culture. During the early Mardi Gras celebration hundreds of years ago, masks were a way for the wearers to escape class constraints. Uh, and social demands. They could mingle with people of all different cultures and classes and be whoever they desired, at least for a few days. Among early men, masking was considered a conduit to the supernatural. The individual becomes the character the mask depicts. Hmm. Individual becomes the character the mask depicts. Let me just pull up a picture of some older Mardi Gras photos here. So, look who this guy became. Ew! 
Masking or costuming altered the state of conscience, consciousness. In the same article, Fuller, quoting Fred Koning, a PhD professor of social psychology at Tulane University, says, masks are a way of being anonymous, and if you wear a mask, you take on a different persona. Among the early tribes, men who wore masks were considered crueler towards the enemies than those who did not. Certainly nobody is claiming masking at Carnival uh, has anything to do with cruelty. Koning says, you can be a little drunker, a little wilder, and a little more primitive. Furthermore, at Carnival, people will be more tolerant of you. Um, normal rules are gone. Traditional routines are put on hold. So you can get crazy. No one cares. Uh, the flambeau tradition. Uh, flambeau, meaning flame torch, was a tradition of people carrying shredded ropes soaked in pitch through the streets so that nighttime revelers can enjoy festivities after dark. Uh, they were originally carried by slaves and free African Americans, and they could earn a little extra money, cross toss money at the torch carriers for lighting the ways for the floats. Today, flambeau carriers have turned their tradition into a performance. Um, they dance and spin kerosene lights, something the original uh, parade planners hadn't intended. The throwing of beads. This tradition starts uh, with uh, the original colors. The color of the beads was determined by the King of the First Daytime Carnival, the King, in 1872. He wanted the colors to be the royal colors. Purple for justice, gold for power, and green for faith. Which faith? Um, let's see. The idea was to toss the color to the person who exhibits the color's meaning. Okay, I've not been to Mardi Gras myself, but I've seen it portrayed in movies in the past. I've seen some of the photos in my research. Uh, who there is portraying, or portraying justice and faith? I don't know. But anyway, um, the beads were originally made of glass, which, as you can imagine, was not good for being tossed around. It wasn't until they were made of plastic that throwing them really became a staple of Mardi Gras. Hello. Hi. I haven't started it yet. Are you sure? Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, the king. Here it gets really interesting. Remember I told you to remember Russia? Every year in New Orleans, a king is crowned and his name is Rex. Pagan and... Okay. The king of the carnival and his first... And he first ascended the throne in 1872. History has it that the very first Rex was actually the Grand Duke Alexis of Russia, who upon his visit to the U.S. befriended U.S. Army officer George Armstrong Custer during a planned hunting expedition to the Midwest. The Duke's visit to Louisiana was organized by New Orleans businessmen looking to lure tourism and business to their city following the devastating American Civil War. Every year, the Rex organization chooses a new Rex. Always a prominent person in New Orleans. And he's given the symbolic key to the city by the mayor. Okay. Handing out a Zulu coconuts. The Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club is one of the oldest traditionally black crews or parade hosts in Mardi Gras history. The organization is known for handing out Zulu coconuts or golden nuggets. Did you catch that? All, all you Illuminati Masonic people, golden nuggets? Okay. Anyway, moving on. The earliest reference to these w uh, appears in 1910. And the first coconuts were left in their original hairy state, but years later, Zulu members started painting and decorating them. And uh, acquiring one of these is one of the most sought after traditions during Mardi Gras. Okay? That's a big deal to get one. Uh, Other lesser known facts, uh, though Mardi Gras technically refers to Fat Tuesday, uh, the Mardi Gras season actually begins on Epiphany. 
It, you don't know what Epiphany is? Uh, it's a Christian holiday celebrated on January 6th that is otherwise known as Three Kings Day or the 12th day of Christmas or as you'll find out later, the Day of Illumination. In Brazil and many other countries, this period between Epiphany and Fat Tuesday is known as Carnival. Uh, whichever name you prefer to use, the... Uh, the revel recent Mardi Gras lasts until midnight tonight when Ash Wednesday ushers in the 40 days of Lent. Mardi Gras origins lie in ancient pagan celebrations of spring and fertility such as Saturnalia and Lupercalia, which is Valentine's Day. Okay, some contend, however, that Mardi Gras type festivities popped up solely as, re solely as a result of the Catholic Church's discouragement of sex and meat eating, meat eating during Lent. But since the Roman Catholic Church is only an extension of the cult of Rome, we can conclude that this is not the case. Uh, New Orleans did not host the first American Mardi Gras. Uh, Mardi Gras is believed to arrive in North America, um, North America on March 3rd, 1699. Six, nine, uh, anyway, uh, 1699, when the French-Canadian explorer Pierre Lemoy Camped about six, I probably said that wrong. Camped about 60 miles downriver from the future side of New Orleans, knowing it was Fat Tuesday back in France. Iberville named the spot Pont du Mavivo and held a small gala. A few years later, French soldiers and settlers. Uh, feasted and wore masks as part of the Mardi Gras festivities in the newly founded city of Mobile, present-day Alabama. To this day, Mobile claims to have the, uh, the oldest annual Mardi Gras celebration in the United States. Mardi Gras in New Orleans survived early efforts of suppression. Uh, they got going as... Uh, in New Orleans, soon after the city's founding in 1718, the Spanish, who ruled the Big Easy from 1762 to 1800, they apparently cracked down on Mardi Gras rituals, and this is documented, though scarce. Uh, U.S. authorities did uh, much the same after taking control in 1803, banning both mass balls and public disguises. Uh, they were eventually accepted... Uh, at the festival's existence. The first recorded uh, Mardi Gras street parade in New Orleans took place in 1837. By the time the city had transformed from a small backwater to major metropolis. 20 years later, six men organized a secret society called the Mystic Crew of Comus by holding a parade with the theme of the demon actors of Milton's Paradise Lost. Along with the lavish Grand Ball, Comus reversed the declining popularity of Mardi Gras and helped establish New Orleans as the clear epicenter in the United States. This year, more than one million visitors are expected to attend. Other secret societies quickly followed Comus's lead. In 1872, the crew of Rex and the Knights of Momus began paying for parades and balls of their own. They were followed a decade later by the crews of Proteus, since these early societies were exclusively male and white. Um, women and blacks formed their own groups, such as Les Mysteries, uh, sorry, Les Mysteries and the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club. Dozens of crews of all types have proliferated since then, including science fiction themed intergalactic crew of Chewbacca's. Okay. Whose name is a hybrid of the Star Wars character and the Roman god of wine. Despite being less than three years old, this crew convinced Peter Mayhew, the actor who played Chewbacca in the movie, to ride the parade last month atop the Millennium Falcon float alongside a mascot called Bar 2D2. Career's not going so well for you. King cake is only eaten during Mardi Gras. 
It's available only during the Mardi Gras season. It's typically made with brioche dough braided and laced with cinnamon. It's glazed with purple, green, and gold sugar covered icing. Uh, Mardi Gras colors. And it's what sets this cake apart from other desserts is the small plastic baby hidden inside. If you get the baby, not only are you supposed to have a baby, more fertility, but you host the next party, more divination. Uh, so, from uh, its risque beginnings, this American edition of Carnival mixed with South American, Jamaican, and American Indian influence was destined to become an outlet for the desires of the flesh. Clearly. The Protestant Church's policy was to denounce Carnival as the idolatrous invention of the Pope. Even the 15th century Neo Georges of Kirchmer described the immoral festival in his poetic work called Popish Kingdom. Let's see what he had to say, shall we? Now, when at length the pleasant time of Shrotide comes in place, and cruel fasting days at hand approach with solemn grace, then old and young are both as made as guests of Bacchus, god of wine feast, and four days long they tipple square, and feed and never rest. Down goes the hogs in every place, and puddings everywhere. The dice are shaken and tossed, and cards a pace they tear in every house are shouts and cries and mirth and revel rout and dainty tables spread and all be set with guests about with sundry plays and christmas games and fear and shame away the tongue is set at liberty and hath no kind of stay all things are lawful then and done no pleasure passed by that in their minds they can devise as if then, if, if they then should die. E. <laughs> okay. The celebration has grown over the years into an enormous fair. Numerous crews or secret organizations that sponsor specific parades or floats uh, have arisen. Approximately one half of them sport the names of pagan gods. No surprise, right? Such as Rex, Bacchus, Chaos, Nemesis, Atlas, Hermes, Isis, Selene, Thor, Comus, Zeus... Dionysus, uh, it's just grown so large that people come from various parts of the world to just enjoy this cesspool of sin. Isn't that great? Of course, included in this thoroughfare of plenty of liquor is plenty of liquor, nudity, sexual immorality, black magic, all right there in the heart of the voodoo capital of North America. So, a riotous promenade that encourages millions to gorge themselves on all their fleshly sins before abstaining over the falsified and biblical Lent season that was to follow. No doubt, historically, uh, when provisions for the winter from the previous fall were becoming scarce. Just saying. Romans 8.4 That then the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that in the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the sin uh, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of this, none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So, let's consider the origin. Okay, I mean, as if I need to point this out anymore. 
Mardi Gras festival filled with excess of every kind, an example of human nature run wild, but unmasking of true origin reveals an orgiastic celebration honoring gods of licentiousness. An article written in the Columbia Electronic Encyclopedia relates that carnival is, quote, a communal celebration, especially the religious celebration in Catholic countries that takes place just before Lent. Since early times, carnivals have been accompanied by parades, masquerades, pageants, and other forms of revelry that have their origins in pre-Christian pagan rites. Encyclopedia here, okay? Um, particularly fertility rites that were connected with the coming of spring and the rebirth of vegetation. One of the first recorded instances of the annual spring festivities is the festival of Osiris in Egypt. It commemorated the renewal of life brought about by the yearly flooding of the Nile in Athens during the 6th century BC, a yearly celebration in honor of the gods of wine. Dionysus was the first recorded instance of the use of a float. It was during the Roman Empire that carnivals reached an unparalleled peak of civil disorder and licentiousness. The major Roman carnivals were the Bacchanalia, the Saturnalia, and the Lupercalia. In Europe, the tradition of spring fertility celebrations persisted well into Christian times, where carnivals reached their peak during the 14th and 15th century because carnivals are deeply rooted in pagan superstitions and folklore of Europe, the Roman Catholic Church was unable to stamp them out and finally accepted many of them as part of church activity. The church succeeded in dominating the activities of the carnivals, and eventually they became directly related to the coming of Lent. Yeah, that's an encyclopedia there. Not some Christian fanatic, so don't take my word for it. Transformation of pagan rites became standard practice in the Roman church. So, I mean, it, it was their means of converting the masses while not causing hostility among the people by removing the holidays they enjoyed. This is also no, noted by uh, Weiser. <sighs> so, while the Catholic Church may have tempted to regulate the festivities of Carnival, uh, it can easily be seen... Uh, as can easily be seen, it has retained depravity of the pagan origins. The truth is, no one could ever wash away the ungodliness of this celebration and make it holy because God was never part of the holiday. The problem is, there is a filthy lie that this and other holy days associated with, with it are Christians and originated in the church. The holidays of Epiphany, Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, and Lent are all part of a shocking man-made religious system. As these ceremonies are investigated, it becomes clear that they all have a common source linking them together in a chain of pagan observances that ultimately lead to the Easter Ishtar celebration. <sighs> the faithful early church observed no holiday celebrations unless it was found in the Bible. Eventually, though, true Christians were forced underground by heavy Roman persecution. A lot of Christians are blamed for the Holy War Crusades, but the truth is, us modern-day Christians who are not Catholic would have been killed in those wars. We were forced underground. We weren't. We weren't there. It's kind of like black people talking about how they were enslaved by America. You were not. You weren't alive. So I guess we were not killed by the Catholics. But had we been alive in those times, we would have been burnt for being heretics or killed, okay? We didn't kill anybody. I guess even modern-day Catholics didn't kill anybody if you want to get real. But this is what I'm telling you. Okay, um, true Christians were forced underground by heavy Roman persecution. In the 4th century, Emperor Constantine pronounced Christianity legal. 
by his famous edict of toleration and this decree brought diverse groups of believers out of hiding free to observe their faith that they argued over uh, and a lot of separation occurred circumstances and times of the year involving Christ's birth and baptism were among the first issues debated and these disputes would continue for years God however cannot be disputed and his word says in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in these latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies and having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, Lent, which God hath created to be received in thanksgiving of them which have and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourishing up the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is Savior of all men, especially of those that believe these things commend and teach. So, right there, Lent seems holy. I mean, I even started saying, you know, I should show I'm willing to give something up for God. He gave his life up for me, and I got into it for a while. Um, right there, be not seduced. Look it up. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 11. So, as Christianity, Christianity excuse me, grew with the expansion of the Roman Empire, apostate church leaders adopted various dogmas, sacraments, and celebrations from the pagan cultures. And, um that had been conquered by the empire, harboring visions of a worldwide Christian order. The Roman church state government forced their teachings upon civilizations they now occupied. Yet it was the church that experienced the most dramatic change, as the famous historian Will Durant later wrote. Christianity did not destroy paganism. It adopted it. The Greek mind dying came to a transmigrated life in the theology and liturgy of the church. The Greek mysteries passed down into the impressive mystery of the mass. Other pagan cultures contributed to the syncretism result. From, the, from Egypt came the idea of a divine trinity, the adoration of the mother and child. That would be Isis and Nimrod. And the mystic theosophy that made Neapolitanism and Gnosticism and obscured the Christian creed. From Fr Phrygia came the worship of the Great Mother. From Syria, the resurrection drama of Adonis. From Thrace, perhaps, the cult of Dionysus, the dying and saving God. The Mithraic rituals so closely resemble the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Mass that Christian fathers charged the devil with inventing these similarities to mislead frail minds. Christianity was the last great creation of the ancient pagan world. The Story of Civiliz Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, page 595. So, Epiphany, let's touch on that real quick since it leads up to this. Fat Tuesday, right? First recognized in 361 AD, otherwise known as Illumination, or the Festival of Lights, since this day was supposed to portray the advent of Christ as the light of the world, the Roman Church modified elements of the winter Saturnalia to form the celebration of Christmas and found uh, in the Festival of Lights. This transformation of a pagan observance is noted by Francis Weiser in the Handbook of Christian Feasts and Customs. 
<coughs> page 141 of that book says the liturgical feast of Christ manifestation originated in the Orient in Egypt during third century modern scholars explain the date January 6th by the fact that the Egyptians celebrated on this day their great festival of the winter solstice in honor of the Sun God the church authorities oppose this pagan observance with a feast of the true manifestation nativity of the divine savior king the christian feast in turn occasioned among the histor uh, her heretical gnostics a feast of christ baptism celebrated on the same day so like the pagans who originally celebrated believers were encouraged to put lights on their homes and in trees until epiphany or the 12th day of christmas in france a fat ox has a prominent role in this celebration a child termed the king of butchers rides in decoration cart pulled by this animal people wear brightly colored costume costumes throw confetti uh enjoy a battle of the flowers as they toss various flora at one another they two horns attend mass balls in the evening at celebrations in and a mass man like doll is burned in effigy in portugal and spain celebrants also throw flowers attend masquerade balls and watch bullfights in the celebration of mexico cuba brazil and other european countries The custom is to wear unique and sometimes ugly masks while they celebrate with parades, floats, and erotic dancing. This is from Customs and Holidays Around the World, page 11 through 12. The custom of gallivanting around the streets and wearing masks dates back to pre-Roman times and a wanton pagan festival known as Lupercalia, Valentine's Day. Douglas again spoke of this ancient rite and reveals how it entered Mardi Gras celebration, bringing its sinful purpose with it. By connecting a divine miracle to a pagan feast, the Roman church made it possible for new converts to continue using symbols of their pagan holiday while redefining their meaning. The use of alcohol continues to be a motivating factor for the wanting behavior during Mardi Gras. Yeah. So basically, um, they perverted Jesus turning the water into wine. This brings us to Ash Wednesday, the day following Fat Tuesday. It was a practice in Rome for penitents to begin their period of public penance on the day of Lent. They were sprinkled with ashes, dressed in sackcloth, and obliged to remain apart until they were reconciled with the Christian community on Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter. Um, so, on Ash Wednesday, people marked their forehead, um with a symbol that they are fasting ash cross which Christ actually forbids public displays of Matthew 6 16 through 18 talks about that look it up I forgot to put it here and I'm rolling so uh, anyway let's read Galatians 4 9 through 11 but now after you've known God or rather are known by God how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements which you desire again to be in bondage you observe days and months and seasons and years I'm afraid for you lest I labor for you in vain those who claim to be worshiping God by their observance of Epiphany Mardi Gras Ash Wednesday Lent Palm Sunday Monday Thursday Good Friday they're, they're worshiping him in vain they may not realize it but they're doing the opposite of what God commands as Mark wrote in his gospel, how be it in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Each of these celebrations has the same source. Their birthplace is Babylon with the false holidays and licentious doctrine. Each observant has a link connecting one with the other in such a way that it keeps people in a state of spiritual blindness. As the ancient prophet Isaiah explained from God's point of view, such people are spiritually intoxicated. Isaiah 29, 9, 13 says, Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, 
he covered, and the visions of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near with their mouth and with their lips do not or with their lips do honor me but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men those who participate in these religious holidays are drunk but not with wine they are inebriated by the false doctrines concocted by the minds of bogus ministers they may read what the almighty has commanded but they do not understand it and they're certainly not obeying. So, Apostle John wrote this to the church. He said, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto, you the, show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon the many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Revelation 17, 1 through 6. When it came to the civil side of this union, God also identified it symbolically through John. God, re God revealed the time of Christ's return when he will finally destroy the false religious system. As his vision unfolds, the apostle depicts an angel who cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the Great is fallen. It has fallen and has become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I have heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelations 18, 2-4. God has uh, identified the source of these extra-biblical holidays and celebrations. We need to take heed and understand that they, uh, where they come from. I'm just going to show you these pictures and I'm going to wrap it up. These are from, I think they're from last year, but this is King Rex. And these are some of the floats. Another, I guess, different King Rex. People. I mean, just look at them. Of the golden calf. And then we get really old school and creepy. <laughs> That's it for me. It's run really late and I've got to go, but God bless you all and I will see you next time. Pray. Pray for America. Pray for the kids. God bless.